Hello and welcome. Today we're talking about the IRS $600 1099K tax rule and the delay on that and what we need to know about that. And then we're also going to be talking about some e-filing changes and just general items about 1099s now that we're in 1099 season. And as a guest on this podcast to kind of deep dive into this topic, we have Christina on from Tax Bandits. So Christina, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm so excited to, to talk about 1099s. Yeah, not many people say that, but I, I get it. Like, I, I, I love talking about tax, and I think that this is an important thing. And the thing about 1099s is they're not super sexy. It's not saving you taxes. It's not increasing your income, but it's a requirement. It's required by law for certain situations, certain areas. And so it's something that every business owner needs to know. And I know we talk a lot about how do we save taxes on this show? How do we save this? What strategies can we implement? And those are all important as well. But just as important as that compliance piece, what do I need to know to make sure that I'm not getting hit with penalties. I'm not getting hit with some of these issues. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So first things first, we're in 1099 season. And this month of January is what I talk about as 1099 season. So let's talk about 1099 NECs and 1099 MISs. So what are some of those? What's the difference between them? When are each used? When are they due? What do people need to know about those two forms? Because if you're not working on those right now, you should be. So let that kind of be as a, as a warning that we're 10 days into the year. Now is the time if you haven't started that, that, that they should be starting to be worked on. So talk to us a little bit about those two forms. Yeah, absolutely. And you are 100 percent correct. Being 10 days in, if, if you haven't started, now is absolutely the time. The 1099 NEC and the miscellaneous, those are definitely the two most common of the 1099 forms. For the 1099 NEC, in is used to report non-employee compensation. So if you've hired a freelance worker or contracted work from another business, if you've paid them more than that $600 threshold throughout the course of the year, you are more than likely going to need to file that 1099 NEC. But the unique thing about it is that form is specifically for that non-employee compensation and it is due January 31st. There are two, two really important deadlines associated with that NEC, the e-file deadline and the, uh, the recipient copy distribution deadline. So not only do you have to file it with the IRS, you also have to make sure that the recipient have their copy by that January 31st de um, deadline. Now, as far as the miscellaneous income, a lot of businesses out there probably remember that this form used to be used to report that non-employee compensation. A few years ago, the IRS reintroduced the NEC to kind of take care of that piece. But the 1099 miscellaneous is still around and it is used to report a wide variety of different types of payments that they kind of just umbrella as miscellaneous income. It, is, it still has that $600 or more throughout the year threshold. So it's still a really common form for a lot of businesses. But a couple of examples of payments that you may be reporting on that 1099 miscellaneous would be rents, prizes, and award. There are a lot of them. My favorite one is fishing boat proceeds because I <laughs> don't think I've ever spoken to someone that needs it, but I just think that's super fun. And it has the same deadline. So the e-file deadline, the recipient copy deadline, those are also both January 31st. Got it. And, and these forms are, are so many people, so many business owners qualify for a need to file at least some form of these forms, whether you're paying a contractor, 1099 NEC, whether you're paying someone for rent, 1099 MIS. And we had a podcast episode that we did at the, at the end of last year. We talked about, okay, what qualifies? Because not necessarily everybody, every contractor you're paying might not qualify for an NEC. If they're an S corporation or different things like that, they might not qualify. So you should know those items from now. And I think this is just kind of that refresher of, hey, these forms were in 1099 season now. These forms are due at the end of the month. They need to be e-filed by the end of the month. They need to be to the recipient by the end of the month. And so if you have contractors that you paid, if you have people that you paid rent to, if you've had royalties, prizes, all different things like that, now is the time to start collecting that information and get those 1099s filed. And we're going to talk later about what does that process look to file a 1099? Because you might be like, well, do I just print it out? Well, how do I do these types of things? We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But let's talk about another type of 1099. And this is a 1099 that People have probably seen a lot of news flashes on, a lot of things in the in the IRS, a lot of changes that are coming around that people are scared about. And so let's talk about this. What let's talk about the 1099K. So what is a 1099K? When would a business owner receive one? Would a business owner ever send one? What does that look like? So the 1099K, you're absolutely right. There's been so much news about it. And it was kind of a really quiet form up to the last couple of years. So now there's all of this talk. The 1099K, it is used to report transactions 
that were made throughout the year using a credit card, a debit card, a gift card, payment apps, online marketplaces. Sometimes they're called third-party settlement organizations or TPSOs. But they, all of these different kind of online transactions or third-party network transactions are recorded on that 1099K. And in the past, that debt that, that forms had a really wide or, or high threshold. So businesses that have payments that exceeded $20,000 and 200 transactions in the year would need to file that 1099K form. And so obviously, that's not your typical small business that's going to have that very specific filing requirement. A lot of, of the talk that's happened over the last couple of years with this form is the IRS has been looking at reducing the threshold. That's really what's caused a lot of this confusion, a lot of this alarm, because for the 2022 tax year, actually, the IRS had planned to reduce the threshold of the 1099K, and they were going to bring it back to that same $600, regardless of Mm. the number of transactions. So if you had $600 or more in any of these transactions, you would have to file. And that, I mean, that would exponentially increase the number of 1099k forms being filed, the number of businesses receiving them and, and having to issue them. And the IRS actually postponed that. So they, last year, they postponed, oh, I guess now it would be two years ago, they postponed it to tax year 2023. So kind of throughout 2023, businesses were gearing up and, and preparing and watching all those IRS publications about that change going in effect for 2024 filing season for tax year 2023. But November 30th, 2023, the IRS has actually released a new publication or a new notice that's stating that once again, they are putting a pause on reducing that threshold. They're kind of holding off. So that original threshold of $20,000 for 200 or more transactions is going to remain in place for the 2023 tax year um, Mm. filing season. And that's good news, right? (laughs) <laughs> that, that is such good news for so many businesses. It's going to prevent a lot of confusion. So they, essentially, a 1099K is if, if you're processing, if you are accepting credit cards, if you're accepting people to pay via credit card, debit card, you're going to be receiving a, you would potentially be receiving a 1099K from that credit card processor. And that 1099K yeah. is just telling the IRS, hey, company XYZ receive this much income from us. And then the IRS is going to say or expect to see company XYZ report that income on on their business tax return. Now, when we talk about this threshold and for generally stating, not a big deal. People receive income, they report on their tax return. Like it's if you receive a 1099 or not, you're still required by law to report that income on there. So it's not a huge deal. But where there was some concerns or or fear about this is when you move it to that $600 mark, we're not necessarily talking about credit cards or debit cards that really kind of cause the concern, but it's more like accounts like a Venmo or a PayPal or things like that, that might have some transactions that were never meant to be income per se, that is now becoming going to raise red flags, potentially raise a taxable item. And I know a lot of people talk about this as kind of like the Taylor Swift thing where people were reselling Taylor Swift tickets for a crazy amount of money. With, that's not, it wasn't intended to be income. They're just, or someone buys Taylor Swift tickets for $5,000 for five of their friends. And now they're, each of their friend is giving them $1,000 to pay for their ticket. Again, not income in any sort of way, but technically that could have triggered this 1099k filing if they received that payment through Venmo or PayPal or something like that. Is that a kind of a correct understanding of that? Yeah, absolutely. And the IRS um, even had a section on their site for the 1099k already that had steps on, on what to do if you receive this form and you don't believe that you should have because, like you said, so many people are using Venmo and PayPal and Cash App and all of these different tools. But there are so many transactions happening that are just like paying your roommate for your share of the rent. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you all went out to eat and then you Venmo each other. And none of those things are really what the 1099K was intended for. It's caused a lot of concern for a lot of people. So the good news is that for 2023, when we look at 2023 specifically, this whole idea of hey, I bought Taylor Swift tickets or I'm paying for rent and people are paying me back. Am I going to have to report that as income or am I going to get 1099K and have to deal with that? At least for 2023, that threshold still remains at that higher dollar amount, right? Exactly. And when we look into the future, because we know that this is a topic that seems to just be, it comes up, people get worried and then it gets pushed back and it comes up, people get worried and gets pushed back. Has the IRS given any guidance on what 
2024 would look like. So tax year 2024 moving forward, what does that look like? Do we still run into a similar issue there? That's a great question. Um, Because you're right, it keeps popping up. So it's it's not going away. Something is going to happen at some point. Right now, um, their their plan for 2024 is that the threshold will be reduced from the $20,000 to $5,000, which is Mm. still a big change, but it's also so much higher than what that $600 threshold would have been. And that that's kind of intended to allow businesses and individuals more of a transition period to get used to the form and exactly what it's for and it's reporting. That could change. We up to November, the end of November, really, of 23, we thought it was going to be required. So there's a, a good chance that could change. But right now, that's the plan. Makes sense. So that's good news for everybody is that you shouldn't have to, especially for 2023 here, uh, as we're kind of getting ready to file our 2023 returns. You shouldn't have to worry about receiving 1099Ks from that Taylor Swift ticket. Or it, This is really meant for business owners. And in, in that's the intention of the 1099K. And what the IRS was imposing or what, what they were looking to do was really just going to make a lot of headaches for potentially even non-business owners. And so that's a good thing that we're starting to push that away. And we'll see what happens in 2024. And if that, that 5,000 number sticks or if something else comes up. But at least we know for 2023, we should be back to normal rules and, and not have to worry about that. Now, when we look at 2023 returns, I know there's some e-filing changes for those. So can you kind of go through what those changes are? Remember, we talked about kind of this e-filing requirement being uh, January 31st for 1099 miscellaneous and the NEC forms. What are some of those e-filing changes that are related to this filing that, that we do have coming up now or this due date that we do have coming up? Yeah, um, absolutely. So the the big thing with the IRS filing requirements for January 31st and, and throughout throughout the filing tax year is they produced what was um, a, a 250 form e-file threshold, meaning if, if you were filing anywhere under that 250 form count, if you wanted to, you could still paper file. They've reduced that threshold to 10 forms. Mm. Uh, and that is, it's not even individual forms. So like in the past, if you had fewer than 250 W-2s and fewer than 250 1099s and 1095s, you could still paper file all of those individual information returns if you wanted to, they, because the, the, the threshold was just separated. This change, not only is it reducing it by about 240 forms, it's also making it collective so that if you have nine W-2s and nine 1099s, that's 18 forms. And now e-filing will be required for your business um, for any of those information returns. So it's a huge change. It's a big reduction and it's going to affect a lot of businesses, even the smallest businesses. Yeah. And this is actually a change that, that, that I can appreciate and I like, because I think that being into technology and just making things easy, easier to process, easier for the recipient to get, making sure things don't get lost in the mail, which we all heard during COVID and all these things getting lost by the IRS. To me, this is just a, something that whether it was required or not, I would recommend business owners to go this e-file route to begin with anyways. And so it's a change that I actually can appreciate it and like. But with e-filing being such a priority now, and again, something that I think is cleaner, easier to do for business owners and just makes the process much simpler, but it might require now that people need to e-file and so they need to have a provider. How are we going to e-file this? What does that process look like? So with you guys, Tax Bandits being an incredible provider for this e-filing process, what are some things that you say people should look at in an e-file provider? And is it something that somebody can e-file on their own without even having a provider? Or is this something that process is too difficult and just find a provider? And then if we have to find a provider, what type of things should we be looking for as a business owner to find that right provider for that e-filing requirement? And that's a great question, especially the question of, can I just file on my own? Because as an e-file provider, we get that question. We have companies or business owners that reach out to us and they're kind of trying to figure out what they want to do as a filing solution. And the feedback that we hear from companies or tax preparers that are trying to just file on their own, it's not an easy to do process. Currently, a lot of companies would need to have like a TCC number. It's it's just very involved. And it also, it's making it harder on you to make sure that the information that you're uploading to the IRS is accurate. Finding a provider, going ahead and, and getting something in place for e-filing, it's more seamless. Some Somebody like Tax Bandits, we specialize in e-filing the form. So that's all that we do. All year, like you said, 1099s are not exciting, 
but we are focused on them all year round. And so we take the feedback that we hear and we we look at the industry and we refine our solution to make it a, a really seamless e-file process. So looking for a company that is focused on that throughout the year and, and has done all the research and, and put all of the time into it just makes it easier than you having to go and figure out how to do it on your own. There are definitely some key things to think about when you're looking for a solution. Big part of it is, can the e-file provider that you're looking at support the volume of forms that you're filing, whether you have 11 forms, thanks to the new e-file threshold, or whether you have 11,000 forms, it's a big concern is can you easily e-file that number with the provider? Do they have all of the forms that you need and the option to correct those forms? Because the last thing you want to do is, is pick a company and file. And then in February, you realize that an, a social was wrong or a, maybe an amount was reported incorrectly and you need to file a correction, but the provider doesn't have that. That's going to cause you further headaches down the road. And, and it's so avoidable. Other really key features are, is there an easy way for you to add your team, um, for you to be able to coordinate and delegate and work together efficiently? And that's a really key feature um, that we've worked on that's really important, especially if you're filing with a team. And then probably the biggest feedback that we hear as we work on support or, or work with new clients and our business development team is the customer support that the provider offers. There's a really wide variance throughout um, our like our e-filer industry about the support that's offered. You know, there's extra cost involved with the support. There's different tiers. And when, it, when it's the middle of January, you're putting that filing solution in place like, like now, it's so helpful just to have somebody that you can reach out to, to ask a little bit more or ask questions about the service that you're new to, but that they've worked on throughout the year. So knowing that mm. they have a good support option is, is really key. Yeah. And one thing that I think about when I look at this requirement of e-filing and, and, and having e-file these forms is a lot of people think that just means it's going to cost a lot of money. Anything when it comes to taxes and now we have to do e-file and I'm not used to e-filing, like this is just going to cost a lot of money. And I think that is also the cool thing about working with a company like Tax Bandits is that this is not a super expensive thing. If you have 10, 8, 15, 10 and 9 forms that need to be filed, W-2s that need to be filed, you're not talking $1,000 to process these things. And I think that's the comforting thing. And again, the reason why I have always recommended do the e-filing process, work with a provider like Tax Bandits because it makes everything easier and it's cost effective. It's not something that's going to break the bank. And that's, I think, an important thing and myth to bust because I think a lot of business owners might think that anytime you're talking about e-filing, you're talking about technology, you're talking about using a software, it creates complexities, it creates it creates an expensive cost now. And I think it's actually kind of the opposite of that. So that's super helpful. So this was good. I, one, Christina, can you let us know where, and we're going to have a link in the show notes. So if you're interested in learning about tax benefits, click that link in the show notes. Otherwise, Christina, where, where can people find you kind of learn a little bit more about what you guys are doing as well? Yeah, you can just head over to taxbandits.com. That is tax bandits, plural. Uh, we have a ton of great resources on our site that are informative about the 1099 and other filing requirements. We also have our pricing information, our contact information, um, so everything you need right there. Awesome. And I appreciate that. And I think that some important key takeaways that, that I got from this is one, we're in 1099 season and we're not going to be in it much longer. And so if you haven't started that 1099 NEC or 1099 miscellaneous, gathering the information, starting to process those forms, make sure you do that now. Take action now. Use this as you're kicking the butt to be like, yep, yeah, okay, it's time to do this. Get it done with. It's a pain. It's annoying, but it's required. And so just get it out of the way, move on, then you can continue growing your business. And also know about those e-filing changes, that the e-filing requirements are changes. To me, it's something like I would be e-filing regardless of the number of forms I had anyways. But if you were one of those persons that was not e-filing and preferred a paper file, very likely you might have uh, fall under or fall over the amount now and you're required to e-file. So just know of those changes. And then obviously this whole 1099K thing. And, you know, at least the concerns now is that the selling Taylor Swift tickets or collecting rent from our friends that they're living with us shouldn't or have to worry about receiving a 1099K for those type of activities, at least for 2023. That threshold has moved up for 2024 and we'll see if it changes in 2024 and see where it comes from there. So this was super helpful, Christina. I really appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to come on. And I, I think it'd be good to have you guys on later in the year as well, just to kind of go through again, those requirements of a 1099 NEC, 1099 MIS. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. And thank you so much for having us. We really enjoyed it. Again, you can find a link to them in the show notes. Otherwise, you can go to taxbandits.com. So thanks, Christina and everybody else. I will see you next week. 
This has been another episode of the Small Business Tax Savings Podcast. If you enjoy our weekly episodes, please leave a review and share with other business owners. You can find previous episodes and more information at www.taxsavingspodcast.com. Thanks for listening and have a great day.